Hello, and welcome to another valuable opportunity to interact and share ideas on issues that will impact the growth of our country and economy. For me, these sessions, which I started before these challenging COVID-19 times, have proven to be a great resource for generating ideas. It has also created a platform for sharing useful thoughts for the development of our dear country. Going through your emails, your reviews and suggestions sent via the Let's Talks platform on my website, I cannot thank you enough for the interest and commitment we all have towards building a country that provides a just and equitable life for all its citizens, especially in times such as this. I want to invite you to join this conversation from wherever you are now, watching across the various digital platforms and via television or listening on radio, use the hashtag, hash John Mahama live, and let's have another exciting digital conversation. From the outset, let me reiterate my advice, ladies and gentlemen, that we must continue to observe the WHO preventive protocols of hand washing with soap and the running water, use alcohol-based hand sanitizers, ensure physical distancing, and wear protective masks. An update by the Ghana Health Service puts Ghana's confirmed cases at 2,074, with 212 recoveries and 17 deaths. The cases are spread across 12 of our 16 regions, with Greater Accra being the epicenter with 1,795 cases. Clearly, we have passed the containment phase of the disease and are currently having to fight against a community spread. While the official statistics are what we have to work with, it is clear that actual cases may be far more than have been captured because of constraints in testing capacity. Unfortunately, government has still not come out with any comprehensive plan detailing its strategy in the coronavirus response. As the president implied in his last address, our destinies are in our own hands. He urged Ghanaians to exercise self-discipline by respecting the social and fiscal distancing guidelines and wear masks to avoid infection. Our healthcare workers are among those with the highest risk of contracting the virus. There are continuous reports that basic protective gear, temperature readers, and other essential items that the president says have been acquired to enable them fight the disease have not been made available to the health facilities. Reports of health staff having to buy their own PPEs have been filtering through from various parts of the country. It is difficult to fathom 
the inaction of government in this respect, considering the access it had to almost 8 billion Ghana cities within weeks of the pandemic. I recently listened to the testimony of a patient who had recovered from the illness, and it is obvious that social stigmatization of persons who are known to have been infected by the virus has begun. Public education and awareness about the nature and transmission of the disease in all the major languages of Ghana has unfortunately been unsatisfactory. This is reflected in the lack of respect for social and fiscal distancing and other preventive protocols, despite the exhortations by the president. The advent of the COVID-19 pandemic in Ghana has also provide, provoked quite a useful debate about the need for a more robust and effective health system. It has become obvious that the system must not only be responsive to the immediate and long-term health needs of our people, but also withstand emerging global public health challenges, such as this novel infectious disease we're facing. It has been widely acknowledged that some of the critical investments we, and I'm referring to the National Democratic Congress administration, in which I was vice president and later president, made in the health sector have proved extremely useful and enabled Ghana lessen the impact of this pandemic on our people and our nation. My brothers and sisters, this acknowledgement bears out the vision and clear thinking that went into the massive investments we made in the health sector. There were uninformed and snide re remarks at the time, some questioning why many such health facilities were being constructed. We were acute, acutely aware, however, that these investments were necessary to modernize a very fragile and weak healthcare system. What we had at the end of 2016 was not the optimum, but great gains had been made. And so if government had diligently continued and added a few more beds and enhanced medical equipment, our situation would have been better than it is today. The pressure on the existing health facilities and our health personnel would have been much less. We pumped in the needed resources to establish health facilities at all levels, from quaternary, tertiary, regional, and district hospitals, to polyclinics, health centers, and CHIPS compounds. These had the effect of opening up the health system and making healthcare accessible to all, including unserved and underserved communities in even the remotest parts of our country. There were a number of these health facilities which were not completed by the time we left office and only required a little more effort to complete. The natural expectation, therefore, was that the succeeding government will swing into action and have them completed and press on to make even further investments in the sector to make the goal of health for all a reality sooner than later. It was also thought that those that had just been completed at the time would be operationalized for use by the Ghanaian public in whose name and for whose benefit the facilities were established in the first place. Governments, citing very strange re reasons, differed in the operationalization of even those hospitals that were completed. The government also failed or refused to complete several key projects that we undertook, not just in the health sector, but also in the roads and education sectors, among others. A clear case of putting politics before the people. A classic case in point is the University of Ghana Medical Center, which I had the privilege of inaugurating in December 2016, and which was ready for use at the time. After an avoidable but protracted tussle with the University of Ghana 
authority over the management of the facility and misleading claims by the health minister that the facility did not have a standby power system. It had to take a one-man demonstration and the COVID-19 pandemic for only parts of the hospital to be opened to treat patients. This is a 650-bed tier 4 hospital that can render cutting-edge services to our people. Today, that facility's ICU, intensive care unit, which was left abandoned for more than three years, is saving lives, serving the very purpose for which it was built. Because of the advanced nature of the equipment and facilities in the University of Ghana Medical Center, health staff were sent to Israel for specialized training to come and operate that hospital. These staff have still not been put to work and are currently dispersed all across our health system. The training they received has unfortunately been underutilized. Similar delays have been experienced with the Municipal Hospital at Ofanko and the Kaswa Polyclinic, both of which we constructed as part of the community development component of the Awoshi Pokwasi Road and the Kaswa Interchange projects. Two years after they were completed, it had to take intense media and public pressure to get them opened. All this was at a time when the no bed syndrome had resulted in a sad situation where patients in need of urgent medical attention were turned away from hospitals because of congestion, resulting sometimes in avoidable deaths. Ghanaians died when hospitals completed and ready with a combined capacity of 900 beds had been left standing idle. But for the deliberate slowdown of operationalization of the University of Ghana Medical Center and the bank hospital, the unacceptable no bed syndrome would not have claimed these precious lives. Talking about the bank hospital, the rather curious case of that hospital and the International Maritime Hospital cannot escape attention. These are ultra-modern, world-class hospitals built with public funds and yet have either remained shut or are underutilized. Particularly worrying is the abandonment of some major health facilities that had reached an advanced stage of completion by the time we left office. I refer specifically to the NMS project under which seven fully equipped 120-bed district hospitals with staff accommodation commenced in 2013 at Dodoa, Kumewu, Fomena, and Abetifi. By early 2016, the Dodoa Hospital had been completed and commissioned into use, while those at Kumewu, Abetifi, and Fomena had reached various advanced stages of construction by the time I left office in January 2017. Whatever the challenges these projects, uh, whatever the challenges with these projects, they should not have been left abandoned and left at the mercy of invading weeds and reptiles, and in some cases, been affected by bushfires. Chiefs, queen mothers, and residents of these communities have on many occasions had to beg and appeal to government to allow the contractors to return and resume work but all to no avail. And what has been the cause of the abandonment and stoppage of work, despite the availability of funds for the continuation and completion? Fruitless and malice-driven value for money audits that yielded virtually nothing. Another case in point is the almost one-year delay of the Eurojet, the Invest Hospital projects. These projects involved hospitals in Tepa, Nsoko, Trifopraso, Salaga, Konongo, Kumasi Regional Hospital at Sewa, and a new military hospital at Afari in the Ashanti region. For one year after the new government came into office, these projects were stalled because the project managers were asked to pay duties and taxes on material and equipment at the ports, 
even though they had a valid exemption granted by the Parliament of Ghana. This situation robbed the people of Ghana of the timely opportunity to access quality health care, which would have been offered in the catchment areas these facilities were to cover. But for the inexplicable failure to continue these projects, we would have been in a much better position to tackle this COVID-19 pandemic across the country with a more robust health system. In addition to more health workers being employed, they would also have had a more congenial environment to offer their critical services. And our people would have had a more dignifying place to seek health care. While even more investment is required to augment the existing health infrastructure, it is important that the plan to do so is credible and clearly thought through. What we should avoid is knee-jerk promises that appear reactive rather than the product of critical thinking and a well-coordinated response to an existing or emerging problem. Ladies and gentlemen, the reaction of the public to the president's promise to construct 94 new hospitals in one year is understandable. Considering his rather tall list of unfulfilled or poorly implemented promises from yesteryears, I believe in a well thought out and forward looking agenda, which ensures further strategic investments in our health sector to meet contemporary and future challenges. This must take into consideration the grave threats posed by global pandemics like COVID-19, SARS, MERS, Ebola, amongst others. <coughs> it is in furtherance of this vision that I announced on my visit to the Western North and Bono East regions in July 2019 that if elected, God willing, in December 2020, I'll establish a regional hospital in each of the six newly created regions. I also indicated that I'll ensure the provision of a modern health facility in each district that currently does not have one as part of my health for all agenda. All districts would receive a modern health facility. These facilities will range from polyclinics to district hospitals. Proper planning requires that we take into consideration location, demography, population, and health needs of the area before siting a health facility. There are, for instance, currently districts with well-functioning hospitals owned by faith-based organizations. In such cases, we will partner with these organizations to upgrade their hospitals to improve their services rather than duplicate it with another public hospital in the same district. And in districts where there already exists a polyclinic or health center that is overstretched by population growth, we will upgrade them to the status of hospitals by adding infrastructure and equipment. I reiterated these in my Facebook Live session late last year. Furthermore, I re-emphasized this commitment in two public engagements since the outbreak of the COVID-19 in Ghana. The first was when I donated PPEs and other medical supplies to several hospitals across the country in a bid to save health workers from being infected. Similarly, I reiterated my vision to build a robust health system when I presented food items to 20,000 households during the lockdown period. On these two occasions, I stated the need for greater investments in healthcare to ensure a total state of readiness at all times to respond to pandemics of the nature we currently face and other disaster situations. And I promise to start and complete phase two of the Greater Accra Regional Hospital, that is the Ridge Hospital, to expand and double the capacity of the 37 military hospital to construct two international standard infectious disease centers and establish two additional international research centers with capacity like the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research 
and the Kumasi Center for Collaborative Research in Tropical Medicine. I've also proposed to establish a national infectious disease response plan that will enable us to prevent the entry of such diseases into our country as we did in the case of Ebola. In all these, let us not forget, the ultimate goal is to build a health system which is ready and able to protect our citizens and health workers against current and emerging threats. And this is the reason why protective equipment and related logistics will become a permanent feature of our response plan and must form a significant part of our strategic medical supply stock. These projects will be carried out using contemporary financing models that bring down the cost of such equipment, such as leasing, which has proven cost effective and is in use in a number of advanced healthcare jurisdictions. In his last broadcast, and indeed in previous ones, the president echoed many of the ideas and policies I have previously outlined. It is gratifying to note that he is listening. Any addition to our health infrastructure is ordinarily welcome, but it is regrettable that it had to take COVID-19 to jolt him into this reality about the importance of such critical investments in healthcare. That said, the fundamental difference between our two respective positions is that I come to the table with an established track record of actually delivering many of such projects with less resources than he has had in the last three and a half years. Fellow Ghanaians, the NDC comes to the table with a clear plan of modernization of our healthcare system. This plan considers global best practices and will have features that guarantee equitable access to quality health care for all Ghanaians. I've taken due notice of concerns expressed by the Ghana Medical Association about the availability of health personnel to man these new facilities. Here too, the NDC has a plan. I announced in my interaction with you last December that we have concluded a public sector human resource gap analysis to guide our employment policy going forward. The analysis shows that for Ghana to reach the universally acceptable, optimal level of health delivery and bridge the yawning gap between health professionals and our population, the Ghana Health Service would require an additional 86,000 health personnel. If we prioritize properly and reduce the large army of ministers and other political appointees, we could probably create more space to accommodate some of our nurses and doctors who are sitting idly at home. We've done it before with the limited resources available to us. My administration employed the largest number of health professionals in recent times. Under my watch, 41,418 nurses were employed by the Ghana Health Service. We increased the number of nurses from 11,125 in 2012 to 52,605 by the time we left office in 2016. And this can be verified from the facts and figures public publication on the website of the Ghana Health Service. Let me assure health workers one more time, you deserve better because the gains of the single spine policy have been eroded. My brothers and sisters, a major plank of our health plan will also be far reaching reforms in the healthcare financing, which will remove all the obstacles which prevent citizens from accessing primary healthcare and relieve the NHS of the pressure from recurring and widening financing gaps, which threatens its sustainability going forward. This only represents a snapshot of my vision of a modern and responsive health system for Ghana. As I've said before, the next NDC government will prioritize government spending in favor of the well-being and welfare of Ghanaians, as opposed to the comfort of only the upper echelons of society. Healthcare will be one of the major priorities of my government.
if elected. Through healthcare, we shall employ more people, both in the health sector and in the manufacturing sector. COVID-19 has proven that we cannot continue to rely on imports. In addition to an improved healthcare system, the biggest concern in the COVID-19 era will be how to rebuild our economy. The pandemic has exposed the extent of inequality in our society, and we must do something urgent to address it. The economy has been projected to come under severe stress with very low growth, high deficits, unsustainable debt levels, and a depreciating currency. This means the excruciating financial emasculation that Ghanaians suffered before the coronavirus pandemic is set to worsen. In the light of this, it will be catastrophic if deliberate steps are not taken to grow the economy for the benefit of Ghanaians. What is your assessment of where we are now? What is the Ghana you look forward to post-COVID-19? I do have some good answers and ideas. I've been meeting with my working group of experts and professionals on the economy, a group that is chaired by Professor Kosi Botre. Our next conversation in due course will discuss some of these options we have come up with. I want to repeat that I cannot thank all of you enough for the interest and commitment we all have towards building a formidable country that provides equitably for its citizenry, especially in such times as this. And so let me thank you once again, and I will now go through your questions, your suggestions, your criticisms, and your contributions. I thank you, and God bless us all. The Ghana Medical Association has stated clearly that they don't have enough doctors to serve in all the districts. Do you have any plans to produce more doctors or you're just promising? As for promises, we are tired of them. We are still awaiting one district, one factory in my district from Equia Owusua Nemaku. Equia, thank you very much for your, your question. As I said, there's a gap in terms of the ratio between doctors and patients. Indeed, there was a time when in the whole of the Upper West region, there were only 12 doctors serving in the, in the, in the region. And so it means that there's space to increase the number of health personnel in all these areas. The way to do it would be to expand training. And so we have the possibility and we have the plan if we get elected to look at the University of Health and Allied Sciences and expand the training of medical professionals in that uh, institution. And then also to look at the University of Development Studies and expand the numbers of doctors that we are able to train in that institution. There are other um, means of doing, fast tracking the training of doctors. For instance, we have the biomedical science students who do four years in university who can transition to do a medical degree, a fast track medical degree in four years. And so if we get some of these biomedical um, uh, students who are finished uh, with their first degree onto a fast track uh, medical degree, we can turn out several more doctors than we are currently uh, doing. And so there are many you know, ways in which this can be done. And I believe that it is necessary to do so if we are to bring health to the doorsteps of all our people. Um, from Mohammed Zaydan Imam. Your Excellency, were there funds for the construction of these facilities? Were there funds for the construction of these facilities enough for its completion at the time you were leaving office? Yes, these were facilities that were designed based on funding agreements. And so they were costed, and based on the costing, the funds 
were raised. Most of these were based on external loans that we contracted. And they had been approved by parliament and actually work had begun. So there must be no reason why the funds were not available for completion of these projects. I believe the funds were available. Um, I think that in most cases, it was a necessary investigation of the projects, uh, a necessary and prolonged due diligence, you know, and value for money audits on the projects that delayed these projects. And if funds became short, then it would mean that because of the delay in executing the projects, inflation would have affected the original cost that we had anticipated to uh, complete these projects. Um, let's see what the next question is. Um, sorry, I did not trust you before. Now I know you are the best for the job, uh, Frank Apia Kubi. Um, thank you for your kind words. Um, from Stephen Musa, what will you do differently when Ghanaians finally confirm you come December 17th in relation to uncompleted projects? Because your opponents say you also abandoned J. Ecoforce projects too. I think that the optimal way forward would be to take an inventory of all these uncompleted projects, not only in the health sector, but in other sectors, and apply resources to complete them before starting new ones. Indeed, there might be some critical new ones that need to be started, but our focus should be on completing the abandoned uh, projects. And I must say that I don't know what projects are being spoken about, but all the projects we inherited from President Kufo, you know, we continued. Some we completed, some we didn't, we didn't complete because of difficulties with uh, raising the resources for them. And I can give you an example. There were the gang of six roads that were being financed from the government of Ghana budget. These were huge road projects that remained uncompleted when we came into office. When we came into office, we took these roads on. The Tetekwashi to Legon Road, we completed it. Uh, Legon to um, uh, Adenta uh, Pantan Road, we completed it. We completed the um, uh, 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 Military Academy Road, that is the Tishi Road. We inherited it from President Kufo. We completed it. We completed the um, um, Achimota of Ankor Road. We completed it. We continued with the Nsawam Suhum Road. Indeed, we finished the bridge and we finished one carriageway of the road before we left office. It is left to the other carriageway, which I expect that this government should continue. But I noticed that in the last three and a half years, no work has taken place on that road. We continued with the Sofo Line in, in, interchange and made it usable. Even though work is not complete, we took it to an advanced stage of completion. And so there are several projects that we inherited from the Kufo government, which we did not abandon, but we continued and finished, and some we didn't finish, and it's my expectation that a succeeding government would have continued and finished them. Um, you are no longer the president. Why do you address the nation with a flag behind you? There's only one president, and that is Nana Adodankwa Akufuado, and this is from Kwesiapia. Well, see, thank you very much. I, I, I recognize I'm no longer the president, and I don't pretend to be the president. The Republic of Ghana has a president, and that is President Nana Adodankwa Akufuado. Um, but there's no legislation that says Ghanaians should not use the national flag. Indeed, we are encouraged to display the national flag as much as we can. And so in private offices, in our homes, if you can put the national flag there, you are encouraged to do that. What makes the difference with the president is that the president has his own standard. And so when you see the president addressing the nation, you see the Ghana flag, and you see the blue presidential standard. That one, nobody in this country is allowed to use that. And that differentiates the president from everybody else. I'm a citizen, you know. I'm not the president. I'm a citizen like anybody else. And I respect the national flag, and I'll promote it whenever I can. Uh, from Kofi Wayo. Central. I don't know if that's part of your name or it's your location. Mr. President, what is your plan to better equip the health insurance scheme and make it focus on its mandate so that it will not veer off to sponsor MPs for study abroad? Indeed, the health insurance scheme has faced 
many hazards. And um, these hazards include venturing into areas that probably are not its core business. Maybe one believes that um, health insurance, if there are any scholarships, they are better handled by the scholarship secretariat. And so if there are any specialized you know, professions that the medical field needs, it is better being handled by the scholarship secretariat than the health insurance. But one of the major hazards the health insurance have, spa have faced is what we call the capping and realignment policy. This is a policy that was introduced by this government. For a government that had said that the health insurance was in crisis, to come and take almost 900 million Ghana CDs every year as, out of the National Health Insurance uh, uh, Fund is, I mean, an issue that one cannot understand. The capping and realignment means that government caps all statutory funds at a certain percentage of budget. And so if you exceed that fund, then government takes the extra and puts it back in the consolidated fund. So as a result of that, I understand that there are facilities that have not been paid for six months. There are others that have not been paid for as long as 10 months. And I'm even hearing an example of some facilities that have not received uh, refunds uh, for their services for almost 14 months. These are unconfirmed reports, but it's obvious that they are unpaid claims, and therefore these are you know, uh, stymieing the ability of these facilities to provide service. In the speak out tour that I undertook, one of the major complaints was about the service being given to NHIS cards holders. It was said that the only service they get is free cards when they go to the um, hospitals and then free consultation. Everything else from um, diagnostics to pharmacists and uh, medical medicines and drugs are all paid for by the individual. And so we need to look at the health insurance and um, re review it. Before I left office, we had set up a committee that did a review report. And it came up with several suggestions, including looking at primary health care and seeing whether we could hive it off the health insurance and make primary health care free for all Ghanaians. These are all ideas and suggestions that came up. We did not implement them before we left. It is my hope that this government would have seen that report and would look at it and begin to implement it. SNIT rubbished your recent suggestion to pay contributors a token amount for three months to enable them buy food during these COVID times. What do you make of that? Yao <coughs> Ameko. Yao, I, I was surprised to hear the response of SNIT. Indeed, um, I've been a member of parliament for three terms. I was in parliament for 12 years, and so I know that the National Pensions Act, Act 766, is what governs uh, SNIT in terms of its operations. But as a, an experienced member of parliament, I know that allowance is made for amendments to acts in order to allow state institutions to do uh, certain things. So when I made the suggestion, I was not suggesting that SNIT should act illegally by paying those monies. My suggestion was that SNIT and government should consider amending the act so that SNIT could make those uh, payments. We've been in parliament when acts, amendments are brought and the certificates of agency, they are moved in the morning and they are passed by evening. If government has the will and SNIT has the will, then it is possible for uh, this uh, to be done. So my suggestion was not that SNIT should act illegally. My suggestion was that steps should be taken to amend the act so that in these trying times, some part of workers' contributions could be given to them to be able to tie themselves over. And I give a specific period for a period of three months until they're able to go back to work and be able to continue their contributions to the social security uh, scheme. This is what social security is all about. <coughs> From Nicholas Walter Lutrod, how can we trust you compared to your main competitor? As you always claim you are incompetent and corrupt, some of us find it difficult now to trust the politician. That is the sorry state our democracy has gotten to. I, I meet a lot of people who um, say they are, I mean, actually, 
their, their, their confidence in our democracy is broken because of the many promises that are made that are unfulfilled. In terms of competence, I have always said that I leave it to the people of Ghana uh, to decide on what the competence or incompetence of any government is. I did my best, and there were some things that I did very well. There were some things that I would have done much, I could have done much better. But these are all lessons that you learn, you know, by engaging um, in, in, in leadership. And so I've learned my lessons, and I'm sure that um, if, if God wills it and I become president again, I would do a, a better job than I did in my first term. Even though we did many things well, there are other things that we will do better. As for corruption, I believe we all know how difficult a fight um, it is to deal with corruption. And um, I believe that we all must be held accountable. I have no qualms of, about anybody being held accountable in my government. And indeed, after I handed over to the MPP administration, I said that all those who served in my government, including myself, must be ready to face the hot scrutiny of accountability. And I'm always ready to do that. I mean, if there are any issues to do with corruption, I believe that this government should go ahead and investigate and prosecute. And that is what serving in public offices, you must be ready to answer to the people at any time. And from <coughs> Rex Omar, we can even make Ghana the center for healthcare in Africa to promote health tourism. Indeed, this was the intention of setting up the University of Ghana Medical Center. It was supposed to improve the health care of Ghanaians, but at the same time, it was meant to become an, a center of excellence in Africa so that people who needed specialized health services could come from our neighboring countries and from other parts of uh, Africa to come and have you know, medical treatment here. And so that was one of the main reasons for setting up that center. It was also meant to stop the practice where government of Ghana top government of Ghana officials had to go outside the country in order to receive uh, medical treatment. Those medical services would be available locally. And so it would not be necessary for the president or for ministers or for other high public officials to go abroad for medical treatment. And so, yes, I agree with you, uh, my brother. It is possible for us to make Ghana a center of medical tourism and let you know, other people come from different locations to come and seek treatment here. There are examples of it in Egypt. Um, there are specialized hospitals where people go for treatment. If you go to South Africa, a lot of our people go to South Africa for medical uh, treatment. And there are several other areas where such uh, services are offered. <clears throat> and this is from Ni Pakpo Samoa Ado. Will you consider a corporate tax to help fund the NHI, Your Excellency? Um, I believe that it will be difficult to increase corporate, corporate taxes, especially when you want to stimulate the economy. Our current corporate tax rate is at 25%. If you want investors, manufacturers, and business people to stimulate jobs, it will be very difficult to pile on another corporate tax. But there are other ways in which we can increase financing to the national health um, uh, scheme, health insurance scheme. And we're going to put a whole list of those alternative financing on the table. I believe that we can make our national health insurance much more robust and more sustainable because it is one of the important lifelines that our people have in terms of having access to uh, good health care. Um, let's see. <clears throat> it says, from Abiku Hayford, Your Excellency, how will you strengthen the teaching hospitals technologically to support medical and allied health students across the nation? We have done this before. We had a major re-equipping of teaching and regional hospitals. Um, this project was implemented by my predecessor of blessed memory, uh, Professor John Ivan Sata Mills where diagnostic equipment were procured to the tune of in excess of $200 million. And these equipment were 
installed in various tertiary hospitals across the tertiary and quaternary hospitals across the, the country. There were CT scans, there were X-rays, there were MRIs, and so many other such equipments. And some of these equipment are still what we have in use uh, currently. It is important that government continues to make sure that our hospitals have the technology to continue to provide uh, good service to our people. And so government will um, uh, continue to, to do this. But we need to put in a system that makes it possible for the uh, equipment to be used sustainably. There are many cases where the equipment break down and the hospitals are not able to maintain them. And so we must create a system where we are able prob probably to allow private sector participation in diagnostic you know, uh, services in our hospitals so that we can make sure that those equipment are always available you know, for use when the public needs them. Um, <clears throat> what are your plans for posting healthcare professionals, nurses, and, and others? Um, like I said, if you look at our ratio of healthcare professionals to our population, we are far behind in terms of uh, doctor to patient ratio, nurse to patient ratio. Indeed, this informed some of the investments that we were making in the healthcare area in order to expand facilities to be able to bring in more um, nurses and, and doctors. Indeed, those hospitals that I just talked about, if they had all been completed, we would have added about 6,000 more beds to the hospital um, uh, beds that we had at the time. And if you do an average of about three nurses to one bed, then you had 6,000 times the number of uh, hospital beds that would have been provided. And so there's space for us to employ more nurses, but it also means that we must expand the facilities so that we have the uh, uh, suitable facilities where they can be employed uh, to work. As I said, we have done a gap in terms of human resource. We've, we've done an analysis of our human resource gap, and we believe that there's space to accommodate more health workers in our public health uh, institutions. It will also help to expand the mission hospitals and the other uh, 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 faith-based organization uh, facilities. It will also allow them to employ more uh, healthcare personnel in their hospitals and other uh, facilities. Um, let's see, Abdul Tamani, um, what would you have done differently if you were president, if you were president of Ghana now? Would you have lifted the lockdown now or imposed total lockdown or curfew? It depends on the science, and that's why I said I don't know the science and the advice that was available to the president. I don't have that same advice. And so I wouldn't understand the reason for his, um, 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 the decision he took. But experts I've talked to, and the Ghana Medical Association and other such institutions were quite puzzled that he raised the lockdown at a time that the numbers were uh, 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 increasing steeply. I mentioned earlier, even before the, the um, lockdown was lifted, that one of the things we needed to do was to expand testing as quickly as possible, increase our testing capacity so that you know the trajectory the disease is taking. And based on that trajectory, you can take a decision whether to raise the lockdown or to maintain it. But be that as it may, the president has lifted it. And after it was lifted, we're seeing cases in all the, the regions. And so it means that we must aggressively uh, uh, expand testing, and we must also expand capacity for contract, contact tracing in order that we're able to identify who has been infected and who they have been in touch with so that we bring them into isolation. Unfortunately, we do not have enough isolation centers because several of these facilities were abandoned. We would have had more facilities where we could bring people into isolation, test them, and observe them. If they don't show symptoms of the disease, then you can discharge them back. But unfortunately, we are constrained when it comes to facilities to even isolate um, these uh, persons who have tested positive for the virus. Um, 
from Adam Kojo Matthias. Hello, Mr. John Mahama. What would you have done differently in terms of stimulus package for the vulnerable people if you were president today? If you do a lockdown, one of the things you have to have right is your humanitarian intervention because you are basically asking people to stay at home and not go out and engage in economic activity in order that they can earn an income to feed themselves. Unfortunately, unfortunately government's humanitarian intervention was a disaster. The whole system of food distribution was so poorly organized and indeed that is one of the reasons I believe that forced the president to lift the lockdown. Because if it had continued, people would have faced the option between starving or coming out and taking their chance with the virus. And I believe that, you know, we should have organized this better. I made a point. I said, we have a system where we are able to deliver electricity and water bills to every corner of this country to collect bills for government. Why could we not have the same system to deliver food to the doorsteps of the people? And so these are lessons that we must learn. And I believe that if I was president, I probably would have planned this better and would have executed it in a much better way. Um, Moraudu, the MPP has not taken kindly to your statement that the Ghanaian economy is in ICU. They claim that you should know better than it is not only the Ghanaian economy that has taken a hit as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and that is, it is the world over. Well, we have other African countries to learn from. We said our economy was so robust and it was the fastest growing in Africa and all that. Ask yourself, how many countries have run quickly to the IMF to go and look for um, 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 relief? You know, we have next door our neighbors, Togo, Cote d'Ivoire, Rwanda, and so many other African countries. If we had one of the best economies, why within only three weeks, you know, our economy was almost on the verge of going on its knees, and we had eaten kinky and celebrated leaving the IMF. We quickly ran back to the IMF. You know, I don't know whether we'll eat kinky and celebrate going back to the IMF to go and seek relief. It is the truth. Even before COVID, there were problems with this economy, and I kept pointing out that the Minister of Finance was engaged in creative accounting. He had put a lot of uh, uh, debts and arrears under the line and was not adding them to the budget accounting. I had pointed this out several times. And if you go, if, if, if your, your mother dies and you pretend that she's not dead, you know, when the body starts smelling, everybody will find it. And so when COVID came, you know, the speed with which our economy already, you know, was, was in, in crisis was, was alarming. Indeed, I said the other time that one top government official said that with the kind of foreign reserves we have, our economy can survive for three months without any you know, external intervention if we are faced with a disaster. We were faced with a disaster for only three weeks, and already we were seeking external intervention to uh, keep the economy afloat. Um, Hajj Kupsin, when you become president again, will you consider the Riendi Water Project as your priority and the Yendi Hospital as a referral center to serve the Eastern Corridor. Absolutely. Indeed, the Yendi Hospital is one of the projects we were working on before we left office. Unfortunately, we're not able to tie in the financing uh, before we left office, but my understanding is that the current government is working uh, on that financing to uh, um, expand the Yendi Hospital and modernize it as a referral hospital. Also, the Yendi water system. The Yendi water system and the Damango water system were both water projects that we were working on and handed over to this government. And I hope that it is being worked on and that soon we shall see uh, the start of these two projects. Emmanuel Metal Labby. Your Excellency, please, what are your plans to develop and equip the pharmaceutical industries so that we can produce drugs and vaccines locally without depending largely on imports? Indeed, I have the track record of supporting the pharmaceutical industry. Indeed, the largest assistance to that sector um, was made under my government. Um, we, under the Exim facility, provided 50 million Ghana CDs 
to Ghanaian-owned pharmaceutical companies to expand their production lines for two purposes. One, to increase the employment um, of Ghanaians, and then two, to expand their products and enable them begin exports into our neighboring West African countries. And this happened under our regime. Tobinko, NS Chemist, Dan Adams, and several other uh, pharmaceutical companies received this assistance. And during our time, I am aware that they started exports to Liberia, to Sierra Leone, to Burkina Faso, and other um, neighboring countries. <clears throat> uh, from Ni Ayite, in your last statement, you talked about herd immunity. What do you, what do you mean by that? Um, herd immunity is when you're faced with a virus, one strategy is to let the virus run through the population. And as it runs through the population, when people get infected or they are exposed to the virus, they produce what is called an antibody. And antibodies are the soldiers that fight off disease. And so once they get the antibody, they're able to fight off any, um, uh, uh, they're able to fight off that particular disease. So herd immunity means that you let the virus run through the population and then the people gain immunity to it. So as the number of people who have been infected expands, the disease has no more space to expand within the population. And so it dies off naturally. And that is herd immunity. It means that you don't do anything about it. You just let it run through the population and let people uh, uh, gain immunity to it. The danger is that with, uh, with COVID, a certain percentage of that population will die. And in our case, it's estimated at about 1%. Uh, for instance, when the head of the COVID response said they, their model shows that about 3 million people will get infected. And out of the 3 million people, about 150,000 will require uh, critical care. And out of the 150,000, about 5% or so will die. And so he said about 15,000 people will die. The, the issue is that his model might be wrong, and that is not only 3 million people, that far more people than 3 million could be infected. And if far more people than 3 million are infected, then it means that the number of people who will die will not be 15,000, but it will be much greater than 15,000. So you don't know who would live or die. And that is why the risk of using the head immunity strategy is very dangerous. There are other countries using it, like um, Sweden, I think, and um, even though there are deaths taking place there, they are not enforcing stay at home and lockdown and so on and so forth. Um, let's see from Agbesi Pakpa. Dear GM, what austerity measures would be adopted to revamp and sustain the economy to fuel the great visionary policies you seek to implement? Post COVID, our economy is going to be in a very weakened state. Indeed, this year, growth is estimated to be about 1.5%. It's going to be one of the lowest growths we have ever experienced since the Fourth Republic. And so what it, revenue is down because the revenues are not uh, coming in. Aside from that, our expenditures have gone through the roof. Our debt is at about 70% of GDP. And so we're going to face very difficult parameters. And so we need to take critical action to bring the economy quickly back on track. But we must do that side by side with making sure that, one, we are um, uh, stimulating business in order that they can create more employment and they can be the driver for bringing the economy back on track. One of the things that I believe we must do and that I intend to do is to encourage and promote Ghanaian business. Because over the years, the share of Ghanaian business in our GDP has consistently fallen. In the 70s, the share of Ghanaian business in our GDP was 72%. Today, I believe, it's somewhere around 40%. And so it means that a greater share of our GDP is in the hands of foreigners than Ghanaians. And so we're going to prioritize Ghanaian business and stimulate Ghanaian business to be able to grow and expand into other areas out of commerce, 
A lot of our people are into commerce. We need to go into manufacturing. We need to go into agribusiness. And we're going to use the strength of the uh, government's budgetary purchasing power to make sure that we're able to stimulate these industries and get Ghanaians to go into these areas. <clears throat> to all Ghanaian, okay. <laughs> When will you name your running mate from Francis Xavier? Francis Xavier, we are on track. We are not behind time. And um, the, the, the party is working assiduously. Um, I have a firm idea who I want my running mate uh, to be. And um, we will name him at the appropriate time. We have timelines that we are working on. Um, we have to... Uh, put up our national campaign team. We have to name and outdoor our running mate. We have to uh, publish our, and, 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 and inaugurate our manifesto. These are all timelines that the party is working on. Currently, we're getting ready to do the training of trainers for our, our party agents. And so we're not late at all. The deadline for naming our running mate is when the Electoral Commission opens and nomination sometime in September. And so we do have enough time. But my brother, in the midst of COVID, you know, what, what is the use of naming a running mate? You can't even outdoor him. You know, the president is encouraging all of us to stay at home. And that's not the most opportune time to come out and, and, and name your running mate. And so we are on track. We have the timeline. I have a fair idea who I want to be my running mate. And um, after I have done consultation at the appropriate time with the National, the national Executive uh, Committee and the Council of Elders, we will uh, bring out a person, a person who will be worthy uh, of, of being uh, um, uh, the NDC's running mate and who will make a significant contribution to the progress and prosperity of this country, I can assure you. Um, it is time to go. We started at 8.15 and it is approaching 9.15. My brothers and sisters, it is the primary responsibility of every government to secure the safety and health of every Ghanaian. And this should never become the subject of ad hoc policy making or reactive governance. Health is one of those sectors where outcomes are dependent on investments made over time. And wholesome experimentation and knee-jerk responses cannot suffice in this endeavor. The lessons learned from this COVID-19 episode must occasion a drastic rethink to our approach to health delivery in our country. Going forward, premium must not be placed on shallow populism or empty sloganeering over substantive investment, careful planning, and policy making. The sort of political point scoring and unnecessary pettiness that led to the abandonment of much needed health projects must never ever recur. Political vendetta should not supplant or derail well-reasoned interventions in nation building. I therefore wish to re-emphasize before you, the people of this country, my unambiguous commitment to completing all ongoing projects I meet when God willing, I become your humble servant once again in January 2021. It is my prayer that the COVID-19 pandemic passes quickly and does not wreak any more havoc than it has done currently. My prayers remain with those who have been infected and are receiving treatments. My prayer and condolences are with the families that have lost loved ones. May the good Lord strengthen and bless the tireless efforts of our frontline health workers who continue to labor day and night to defeat this pandemic. And let me reiterate again to those who have lost their loved ones among the 17 who have unfortunately passed on due to this pandemic, I express my heartfelt condolences and reiterate that their memories will be honored even more diligently as we work in future to prevent such a catastrophe from befalling our nation again. I thank you for allowing me into your homes this evening, and thank you for watching, and may God bless our homeland, Ghana.
se abanya e wo su e be hwe na ayentem na sa hospital se wo tepa nsoko fomina kumewu salaga ene sa miamani na omba yentem na omu ewi na me she gana fo bo se se nyame ya adom na me ye president bioma sa project ya kan rim ni na ye be ye ho adwuma na ye wi ehm yeah na maza de mata eh yo eh mangananda muke ye ni dabotun aspiti aspiti na local chain at mills the local chain na mukafara and the government is sabon de azo ya berduka a chicken dazi iki I'm very Ike King eating what are now hospitals. I've been there now for the name. Allah so yeah, Musa Mumulki, inshallah, inshallah, eating hospital, the polyclinics in the Akafara Duka and the Duka Asara Chicken Daji, Moon Kama Duka, Mui Aikinsa, Mukari, Sabo de Mutani Mususamu Zaman Lafia. Um pan uh and so pan and uh and terianicake uh and when you Mulgeri um Cabri Kamalguanka Mulgeri le uh hospitals bashing uh nobody at a mills but Geminito, no marble geminito, and them fara a hospitals at them ta be bankening when you to hospital conley was salaga, we anchor them fara kakaba for for the government we kaba sona, no longer a hospitals and keke. But you got more and young company politics, so never you got more. Kusun Kapagan Gani be a lefany, never surely, never surely, no Japamunana, Langan Bachana Gana, Bukabere so. Lombo Ashuna Keke, a hospital's way Bukayaga and Le Kupuntu, Amkeke, and Yam Piamu, and Longamunene, Abashun and Sir Bassa. In your meme, Mene, Noni will be G. Uh, hospital sunny uh, Kenya Kai at a mills me uh, at a mills your uh, government me care uh, me who were born care Nakai hospital say uh, coming yeah if you are he knee government uh, 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 new government air bank Nakai hospital say fair as she he wore me naked he laba more more you're gonna name Wana na kai hospitals kodi oke ogbe me aya ni aya chame he wo mi ke mo fia mo akeke nyu mo wami ni mba ta se no eko na kai hospitals ke ni bi fe ni na kai government ashi ashi no fe wo ba mo mi ni wo wo sa fe koni gana bi ana he wale nya yu adon agbo 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 agbo